Um, so as, as was alluded to, I will be talking to you primarily about the new current diffractive imaging beamline uh, that we're building here at NSLS2. I put together a quick introductory slide. So we are building this new beamline. Um, it's, it will have an emphasis on Bragg CDI. So I'll talk a little bit about Bragg CDI since you may be slightly less familiar with that variation of the technique. Um, but it should support, or it is designed to support, I should say, uh, different versions of CDI. So basically any geometry that you could imagine doing CDI, and we should be able to accommodate this beam line. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to give you a quick review of um, current diffractive imaging. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the distinction of Bragg CDI compared to forward scattering. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the scientific motivation behind the beamline design. Because this is pretty much an expert audience, I'm going to go through that stuff pretty fast. Um, so it's there only to provide you with a window into what we're thinking about when we're designing this concept. But please feel free to stop me at any point to, um, to ask additional questions through that. Uh, and then we'll get to the stuff that I think is probably more interesting in this audience, which is um, comments on the development of the CDI design, you know, some of the more technical details about how we went about the design process for this beamline, and then a presentation of, um, of what we're actually going to build, what is actually being built right now. So you guys all know this, I think, but I'm going to put it in here just for posterity. So the, the point of current diffractive imaging is to collect an image of an object without using an imaging lens. And so to do that, we end up measuring the intensity that's scattered by the sample. Um, but the light, of course, does the same thing uh, with a lens, but the lens interprets the field as it moves through the lens and, and then gives you an image at the end. And we don't have that lens by design um, because X-ray lenses are very difficult to make and they have... Um, uh, not so nice characteristics that we can talk about if necessary. But in order to mimic that behavior of a lens, we need to develop um, the phase of the field uh, that is that corresponds to the intensity being measured in the, in the detector in the far field in our case. And so this is essentially an ill-posed inverse problem, right? We, we measure intensity and we need the complex amplitude. And so we need to figure out some way to do that. And of course we do that with the traditional iterative, um, the iterative solver uh, in this case. So this is, um, just a, a quick demonstration, right? Um, you, you start with a guess of what the object must look like based on its domain support constraint. You propagate that into the far field. You replace the amplitude, the calculated amplitude from this object with the measured amplitude. You keep the phases, which are incorrect. You propagate that back uh, and to the, the real space domain or to the sample space domain. Um, and then you do that same process over and over again. Uh, developing uh, an estimate of what the phases were that corresponded to the intensity that you measured in the far field, and then using that intensity uh, plus the phase that you recovered to get back an image of the object. And so that, that is essentially how this works, or at least in the way that we implement it. And uh, I have this movie, which would make slightly more sense if you were all intimately familiar with the Brookhaven icon, uh, but, but you'll see. This is kind of the, the process um, that uh, the algorithm goes through. This is actually error reduction, ER, and some, uh, some solvent flipping uh, for technical details. But this thing on the right is the intensity that was fed in. And you can see that you make sort of gradual progress uh, toward a, a pretty realistic estimate of what the object was, at least in this simulation. The real reason uh, for me to show you this simulation in this audience is that uh, if you don't know what the truth object actually looks like, and if you don't know that it looks like this little icon that's associated with the Brookhaven logo, uh, you, you know you might be tempted to stop your iterative phase retrieval here, which is where the object sort of starts to become recognizable as an object. And so one of the challenges that I think we all face, um, and perhaps we can think about collaborating on in the future, is knowing exactly when we should stop. And you know, do you, you stop at this point in the reconstruction? Do you stop at this point in the reconstruction where you still have pretty dominant lines, which are not real? Or do you let this thing go all the way to the end um, and get a, a pretty realistic estimate of the smooth object? Um, incidentally, it, it recovers these three, these three logo colors. That's in the logo. One of the intriguing things about CDI, at least from a facilities perspective, and certainly one of the things that I found intriguing about it throughout the course of my career is that the CDI is sort of inherently multidisciplinary. You, you sort of have to draw from a large variety of, um, of areas of expertise in order to execute a, a CDI experiment effectively. And so, you know, this is kind of a, a very nice place for us to, uh, to interface with other uh, facilities within the laboratory. And so it's a benefit of working in a facility. Uh, to, to come together and, and all work together to solve, you know, these, these interesting problems. So how is CDI implemented? Again, I, I'm sure you guys know this. This is, um, you know, 
John Yao and, and David Sayer and Janusz and all these people did these first experiments at the original light source here at NSLS, when NSLS was still operating, uh, but Brookhaven still persists. And they, they measured a diffraction pattern and then used that diffraction pattern and some supplementary information to recover this image of the object. And that was, you know, almost 25 years ago now. Um, but it, it's since been demonstrated in a number of geometries. So you can use this forward scattering geometry, which was where the initial demonstration was done, where, where a lot of the soft X-ray work is done, uh, where a lot of the uh, biology work has been done. And, you know, it is now a, a very similar geometry to a scanning probe um, uh, X-ray microscope or a tachography experiment. You can do these things in the Bragg geometry. And this is, this is primarily the motivation for the instrument that we're talking about today. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Or you can even do these things in the grazing incidence geometry. Uh, and I'm sure that you know, Yvonne and others can tell you all about how that might be useful to, um, to look especially at interfaces and the physical phenomena that occur at interfaces. So CDI, generally speaking, provides a, a means to acquire imagings that depend primarily on the detector. So you have to pay very careful attention to how well you sample, at, at what sampling rate you sample this, uh, this diffracted intensity. But they don't have an imaging lens. And so for x-rays, this is particularly powerful because uh, an aberration-free imaging lens is something that is very, very difficult to achieve with x-rays. Um, and doing this, CDI can also give you near wavelength limited resolution, right? So your resolution is at least in principle determined by the acceptance of your detector, which, you know, again, doesn't mean you have to worry about the numerical aperture of an imaging lens and the accompanying depth of field. So our CEI beamline, I apologize for the name. Uh, <laughs> it's just the one that stuck. Uh, we'll support all of these geometries. And so that was one of the design criteria that went into this beamline. I put this up here so that you're thinking about Bragg diffraction. So uh, one of the, the hallmarks of this instrument is the fact that it's designed uh, to do Bragg CDI in addition to Ford scattering CDI. And so we will be looking, the science case is strongly centered around looking at ordered materials, although it's not limited to them. In three, in, geometry, you basically just do a tomography experiment to get your three-dimensional information, right? You just rock the sample, um, you know, around an axis and you look at the, at the patterns coming off in, in the forward scattering and then as a, a very similar uh, experimental geometry to um, X-ray tomography or, or indeed any kind of micro CT imaging. In the Bragg case, you, uh, you have a non-trivial Q, so the momentum transfer is not zero. You're, you're off the zero, zero, zero peak uh, if you're used to thinking about uh, crystallographic reciprocal space. And instead, what you can do is you can rock the sample with respect to the incoming beam, and you take these different slices um, as you do that and, and collect the three-dimensional intensity distribution uh, in the reciprocal space uh, using that, that technique. There are alternate methods, right? You can change the magnitude of this, uh, this K vector by changing the energy of the incoming field, and that will also allow you to rock through the three dimensions. So you, you get the three-dimensional information in a different way than you get it uh, with um, with Ford scattering CDI, uh, but it is still there. And so this works, right? This is the, the Nature paper from 2006, um, where we, we reconstructed this lead crystallite and then looked at the, the, um, the phase of the reconstructed um, real space estimate of the object, and then interpreted that phase in the context of some deformation within the material. And so that's, that's kind of the reason that you go to this non-trivial queue is that you want to get that deformation information out of the crystal. And so, again, I think you probably are all familiar with these examples, but these are kind of the, the kinds of experiment, these are the kinds of experiments that we were thinking about when we proposed this experiment, this instrument to be built. And so we want to use this, uh, this fact that we can go to a, uh, a non-zero queue and image lattice defects in materials uh, and, and also looking at deformation fields. So this is just an example from Andrew at uh, then at Argonne, where he looked at this battery material and then isolated a, a defect within it. And the defect then is, uh, is kind of um, is typified by this very, um, this very well structured phase in the reconstruction. And so that, that tells you what kind of a defect is present inside your particle. You do the same thing with deformation. So this is an experiment from Anna um, where, uh, where they looked at um, metal catalysts uh, in, in changing the environmental um, concentration of carbon monoxide, I believe. Uh, which then changes the deformation inside the catalytic particle. And you can do that as a function of, of time, right? You can watch these processes evolve uh, in time. And that gives you the kind of a, a better picture 
of allowing you to uh, design new materials, a better picture of the phenomena, which in turn allows you to design better materials to take better advantage of the phenomena that you're observing. And this last one is from Jesse Clark, um, who at Argonne at, at Ross's Beam Line at 34IDC looked at this calcite crystal uh, and, and monitored the growth and dissolution of this crystal in situ. And so these are kind of these kind of typify the, the experiments that we were thinking about when we wanted to develop the capabilities for the CDI beam line. We want to be able to look at deformation, we want to be able to look at defects, we want to be able to monitor things in time. And so that has, uh, you know, the, the carry on effects um, on the design of the beam line are that you have to provide a great deal of space in the vicinity of the sample to allow the beam to be properly conditioned and to allow sample setup. And you have to try to maximize the amount of flux that you can put on the sample and use in the CDI reconstruction so you can push the time resolution as far as is reasonable. And in fact, the time resolution of these, these experiments is probably going to be determined mostly by the, the interaction of the beam with the sample. And so, you know, that's where we want to be. We don't want to have an instrument limitation. We want to have a sample limitation. I put this slide in here, uh, which was again the, an experiment that Jesse led at LCLS um, that we participated in with. The reason it's here is that it's a, it's a laser pump x-ray probe experiment that was set up at LCLS, but it, it kind of, this picture gives you a good idea of how crowded that sample interaction region becomes. And so this is, you know, this is the image that I show to people when I motivate how much space I need to have reserved around my sample to make sure that we can actually conduct these state-of-the-art experiments. There's my, I, yes. Um, so, changing course a little bit, right? So we talked a little bit about CDI, the, the kinds of experiments, the kinds of science that we want to target with this instrument. And now we want to talk a little bit about the technique because we, you know, despite the fact that CDI was demonstrated 20 odd years ago, we're still actively developing techniques and it's something that I'm very interested in doing myself, right? And so I think we, in this slide, in the next couple of slides, we're going to go back and think about the assumptions that were made during the additional demonstration of CDI and um, how those things have evolved and how they might evolve in the future. So I just put this slide up here to remind everyone that, that generally speaking, we assume the field incident on the sample is fully coherent. That's a little bit problematic in that it's not fully coherent. Uh, and also in that if you can use partially coherent flux, you get more light. And so you can push yourself back into this regime where the X-ray interaction with the sample is determining how fast you can do the measurement and not your instrument. And that's where we want to be. Uh, and so, you know, a while ago now, uh, we did some work in Melbourne. Um, Lachlan Whitehead was the lead on this experiment um, using 2IDB at, uh, at APS, where we could uh, manipulate the transverse coherence of the beam incident on the sample, and then demonstrate that not only can we recover the coherent modes that are present in the illumination, but we can also use that coherent mode decomposition to good effect inside the reconstruction. And so this, this little figure on the right here demonstrates that if we do this coherent mode-based propagation, which is the new method uh, in this figure from PRL, um, we can tolerate with, with, a good, with a good resilience the low coherence of the beam. And, and in fact, when you, when you go to the high coherent case, when you basically match the beam size to the coherence length, you, you get almost the same reconstruction as you get with the low coherence case. Uh, whereas if you assume inside the algorithms that the propagation is purely coherent, weird things start to happen, right? Even in the high coherence case, the, um, the algorithm struggles to understand where it needs to distribute the energy inside the, the estimate of the object. And so you get kind of this strange modulation in the amplitude of the field uh, emerging from the sample uh, that's not physical. Right? And, the, and the algorithm just doesn't know how to deal with that because you're telling it that, that the illumination is fully coherent, but it's not. And so there's this ambiguity. And of course, if you go to low coherence, uh, things just don't work if you assume that's partially, if it's fully coherent. Um, and this is just a demonstration of a Young's double slit that showed our partial coherence. You can do the same thing with the temporal coherence. Uh, so this was another experiment to IDB where they, they just opened up the, um, uh, the, the slit determining the monochromaticity on the grading and allowed the entire undulator harmonic to come onto the sample. And they demonstrated that if you know what this is, you can, you can make little temporally coherent bins uh, within, the, within the undulator spectrum, which is this thing on the right over here, and use that again inside the, the algorithm, the propagation step, to recover the actual object, which is this thing in the middle here, 
Whereas if you just assume that you have fully temporal coherent light on the left, it doesn't work, right? Because you're, you're not actually doing the right thing. And so these are, these are kind of um, in addition to the Fresnel CDI one. So the Fresnel CDI is where you put your sample slightly off the waist of the focusing beam and you use the, the known phase of the illuminating field to kind of stabilize, to bootstrap, if you will, the algorithm. And this also has strong, um, this has a strong effect, a strong positive effect on the stability of the reconstruction and, uh, and the resilience, which it means that in principle to get a low resolution image, you take less data uh, because in, in this particular case, you have this holographic reference sitting in the middle of the object, sitting in the middle of the diffraction field. And so these, these three examples are the ones that I pulled out to sort of um, give an indication of what we're thinking about when we're thinking about the future of the technique, right? So we're, we're thinking about how you can basically design an optical system that will allow you to make interesting changes. Uh, and by interesting, of course, I mean helpful changes uh, to the illuminating field on the sample. And so that, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about the requirements on on the instrument based on the sample and a little bit about the, um, the upside uh, for developing the technique in the future as, uh, as demonstrated by previous responses. And so this part, uh, we then move on to the kind of the meat of the presentation, which shows you um, sort of what we've actually done, how we've taken that inspiration, we've used it to develop a beamline concept, and then we're, we're in the process of constructing that. So I'm here at NSLS2. Uh, and so of course the beamline that I'm talking about is at NSLS2. NSLS2 um, came online in 2014, first light in October of 2014, eight years ago. Uh, and it's a, it's a very bright source, right? So the coherence properties are very, very good, especially below about 15 kilovolts uh, because we're a 3G ring. And so uh, there's, a, there's a lot of opportunity at NSLS2 for using the brightness of the incident X-rays in, um, in developing both high resolution images and also developing time resolved images of interesting samples. Um, mostly I'm focused on material science, but you know, we're, we're not excluding other areas. So you know, we're very interested in, in pursuing as many things as, as are applicable to our source. The final concept uh, for the CDI beamline, and again, I, I apologize, we started off with almost 10 acronyms um, and, uh, and CDI was the only one that, that tested well. Uh, so the, C, the beamline has the same acronym as the technique, which is a little confusing, but it is what it is. Uh, so the CDI beamline will be located at 9ID of NSLS2. Uh, the optical design takes full advantage of the current X-rays, the, the brightness of the source, and interestingly can change the X-ray spot size and the beam properties, which provides unique capabilities uh, for pushing technique development and therefore uh, generating faster and higher resolution images of samples and more robust images. The, the optics are sort of shown conceptually here on the left. We've got a source. In our case, that's an IVU um, with an 18 millimeter period. It's an undulator source. We, um, we bounce off a monochrometer. So the first crystal of the monochrometer, uh, there's actually a filter in here, but the first crystal nevertheless sees the filtered white beam uh, from the source. The crystal is a double crystal monochrometer, two crystal pairs, it's a silicon one one pair and a silicon three one one pair. And then that, that, monochroma, that monochromatic beam is the incident on a pair of cylindrically bendable mirrors. Um, and so these mirrors uh, can change, you can change the radius of the cylinder that changes the effective focus. And, and then that beam coming off of those mirrors is incident on a pair of KB mirrors. Now these KB mirrors can independently move in the direction of the beam propagation so they can move longitudinally. And so by making this, this four bound system composed of two bendable mirrors and two translatable fixed figure mirrors, we essentially have a zoom optical system. And so that zoom optical system allows us to change the, the spot size of the beam without essentially without losing flux. Right? There's a little bit of flux lost due to imperfection in the optics, but um, our simulation showed that we have very similar flux in both the, the large and the small beam cases that we've considered. And then that monochromatic focus beam is instant on a sample, uh, which will sit on a goniometer. Uh, and then the, the scattered light will move off into two detectors, uh, which will be independently positionable. And so this optical design allows us to, to tailor the properties of the beam coming onto our sample to best meet the needs of the experiment. 
And then the, the detector motion system coupled with the two area detectors allows us to, to look at various kinds of samples, right? So these are just, these things on the right are, are sort of three paradigms that we're thinking about. Uh, the first one were the incoming beam um, is, it, is, is, is incident upon a single crystal sample. And then you measure two different diffraction peaks using the two different detectors. Uh, you might imagine a situation where the beam comes onto a heterogeneous sample. You want to measure in the forward scattering direction at the same time that you measure a Bragg reflection. So you get some information about both the amorphous and the ordered components in the sample. And you might imagine a situation where the, the incident beam comes into a polycrystalline sample and one measures the diffraction peaks uh, from different crystallites within the sample. Um, if your instrumentation is good enough, you could even imagine that these are neighboring grains within the sample, right? So if you can localize two grains and find the diffraction peaks, you might be able to, um, to provide interesting information about intergranular forces. And so that's the concept for the beam line. Uh, in order to actually execute that concept, we, um, we conducted extensive simulations these were, you know, years long simulation um, campaigns. Uh, we used Synchrotron Radiation Workshop, uh, which was um, supported here by Oleg Chubar. The benefits, the, the, the things that drive us particularly to report a tool like this are the, the realistic physical optical simulations, the wave-based propagation, which is really critically important to understanding how our optical system works. And this, uh, this newly minted ability to look at coherent mode propagation, um, which is uh, an emerging technique and is kind of a, it's a facilitating technology that allows us to take advantage of the things like the partially coherent illumination and the reconstruction that I showed you earlier. Uh, so Oleg is the primary author, I think we could safely say, and I put the GitHub link up there for SRW. Um, these simulations were used to determine the positions and the range of curvatures, as well as the, the, uh, the figure of the fixed figure mirror inside our, our final optical design. And so, you know, there was a lot of going back and forth about trying to figure out exactly how that would work best. Uh, and in the future, we, we plan to use, especially the current mode decomposition. So this I think is quite exciting um, and that it should allow us to very quickly and accurately simulate uh, experiments, which will, help users to choose the incident properties that are best for their samples. And we can use these, uh, this coherent mode decomposition inside the reconstructions to, uh, to give us a slightly uh, a leg up on solving these problems. Uh, so this is just some technical detail. Um, our, our kind of photo, our, our spot size range, our targeted range for this beamline is about one micron to about 10 microns. And that's facilitated as you'll see later by a very long sample to sector distance. And so these are just the properties that, that show you the things that are kind of involved, the things on which our final sample, uh, our final illuminating beam properties depend, the, the, principally the, the shape of the beam and the, um, the coherent properties. So we have the aperture for the vertical pre-focusing mirror, the curvature of the pre-focusing mirror, the aperture of the horizontal pre-focusing mirror, the curvature of the horizontal pre-focusing mirror, and then the apertures of the KB mirrors with these fixed figures. Uh, and in principle, we can also change the, um, the distance, the displacement along the beam, which is this final column. Uh, but anyway, so these are the simulations that show the, the sort of one micron beam focus you know, on waste. So you, you match the, the size of the beam, the horizontal and vertical, and then you can match that with high accuracy of the degree of coherence. And so you can, yeah, I should say this is, we, we were expecting to get, in, in this particular case, we're expecting to get about 10 to the 12 photons per second at 8 kA. Um, that, that number will go down a little bit due to physical realities, but this is what the simulation show. Uh, we also have the capability to make the beam significantly larger. And so this is a, this is a set of simulations. I should have mentioned incidentally, uh, Yuan Gao may actually be in the audience, despite the fact that he's formerly on vacation, I think. And, uh, and, Olog, and Oleg Chubar are particularly responsible for these simulations. Uh, in this particular case, we, we said, okay, well, now we want a 10 micron focus. And so we changed the the, the apertures and the curvatures of the mirrors uh, along the path of the beam to make this larger spot size. And in this case, although the beamline has the capability to translate the, the KV mirrors, we didn't translate the KV mirrors. So this was like a trial run to see what we can get away with without moving the KV mirrors around. And you can see we actually get very close uh, to matching the, the beam size and the degree of coherence. We lose a little bit of flux, which is demonstrated by the fact that our vertical degree of coherence is much larger than the beam size. 
Um, but this is a this is an interesting property. It's an interesting way that the optical design responds uh, to the change of the of the spot size, and it's principally driven by the fact that we have a very long beam line. Uh, so we can talk more about these simulations if people are interested. But I don't want to I don't want to dwell on that. Um, we are we are currently building uh, the satellite end station. I apologize, my orange box got misplaced. Uh, the orange box should sit over here near the LOB4. Uh, the, the satellite building, which will house the end station, is going to be this, this very large barn-like structure. Uh, this was the, the top right is the, the groundbreaking ceremony for that. So these things are actually real. They, they've come out of the computer and, uh, and actually have physical presence. Um, but in any event, in, in the near future, there will be the foundations for a building sitting right here uh, beside 744 at NSLS2, which will house this, this structure. Uh, if, if, you, if you have a, an x-ray view, of the beam line, if you will. Uh, you can see the entire layout. We have a first optical enclosure, which has the monochromator and the pre-focusing mirrors in it. We have a, a B hutch, which is situated in about the midpoint of the beam line, which contains diagnostics, which tell us whether or not the mirrors are doing what they're supposed to be doing and whether or not the beam is moving around. And then we have this very large satellite building at the end, uh, which houses this equally large hutch. Um, so the, the nitty gritty of the, of the beam line is that the distance from the sample down here at the bottom left to the source up here at the top right is about 100 meters. It's actually designed to be exactly 100 meters. Our energy range is 5 to 15 kV. We're expecting to see more than 10 to the 11 photons per second in that spot, um, almost independent of the spot size. So this is, this is in contrast to a traditional um, scanning probe microscopy layout where you change the, the final uh, focus spot size by changing a secondary source aperture. We don't have that secondary source aperture in this design. And since we don't, we can basically preserve the flux. So this, this beam line is extremely efficient at, um, at propagating brightness. And so it doesn't matter so much about the size of the beam. It's designed to, to take a, a coherence fraction and to propagate that coherence fraction onto the sample. Uh, we have about a one to 10 micron spot size. Of course, we can make them. This is really the range over which we were confident that we have pretty good control of the properties of the beam. And then uh, we can vary the coherence within that range. I think that's all I wanted to say, although I can take questions on that. This is what the inside of the, the hutch looks like. So inside the hutch, we have this very large diffractometer. So this guy is designed to bring a, an area detector to within half a meter of the sample and then to move it as far away as 10 meters. And then the, the horizontal scattering angle, excuse me, horizontal scattering angle is uh, about 125 degrees. And then the vertical scattering angle is determined by the elevation of the detector, which is about one and a half meters. And so if you go to half a meter from the sample, you get about a 70 degree scattering angle. And if you're sitting all the way back here at 10 meters, you get about eight degrees, nine degrees maybe. Uh, but this entire thing is, is designed to allow you to look at a sample, which is very large. So when the fringe spacing and your diffraction pattern becomes very small, you can move your detector away. Uh, there's also, a, I'll show you in the next slide, I think the, the region around the sample. So I'll show you that we have a very long working distance here. The, the hutch size is very big. It's about 24 meters by 34 meters. And then it's got very tall ceilings. Um, I have 15 foot six, I think is my minimum clearance. So it's about a five meter roof height. Uh, the detectors will be able to move independently on these rails. There will always be two of them. Um, I said all of that. Yeah, we're, we're planning for up to 30 kilogram detectors. So this would be like a four megapixel detector or so. And then our, we've designed all these parameters assuming a pixel size in the 50 to 100 micron range for the detector. There's also the, the propagation distance between the sample and the detector is, is decided to be helium rather than trying to deal with a vacuum flight path of that This is the sample interface region. Uh, so the sample sits here on a, an Euler cradle um, you have this very long working distance. So you have like a meter and a half between the, the sample and the end of the mirror tank for the, the Kirkpatrick Baez mirrors, which sit in this tank on the upstream side here. And then on the other side, uh, you see the same thing. Beam comes in from the left, they hit the KB mirrors. You have this very large propagation, again, with a helium filled path, um, and then onto the sample. And so that, that area, especially here, we have plenty of room for cleanup apertures, uh, ion chambers, beam position monitors if we need them. Uh, and if we get clever in the future, perhaps even a, a scattering source to help us monitor the wavefront uh, as we go. Uh, one of the challenges of this beam line, incidentally, you'll see demonstrated by this figure. I think this dude is like five foot six, something like that. 
but the the beam position off the floor is 1.6 1.625 meters um which is a bit high uh, and so you know this is a this is a uh, an outgrowth of the fact that we've got uh, a vertical mirror uh, in the foe in the first optical enclosure so there there are some uh, challenges all right so we're nearing the end here so what's the cdi beam line going to do and when is it going to happen so it's designed to conduct state-of-the-art CDI experiments and then to facilitate next generation coherent techniques with a unique optical design and very flexible scattering geometry. It'll provide spot sizes that are sort of 10 microns uh, in size with good control uh, for, for experiments on real materials. And then uh, it's being constructed as part of a, a Department of Energy major item and equipment grant. Um, so it's called the Next2 project, which is currently underway. Uh, and first slide is expected in January of 2025. And so, if, if anyone has any uh, any exciting experiments, uh, you know we can start to try to plan those now. I'm happy to talk to you about that. Uh, and also, if you want to collaborate on technique development, you know I think we can all always use more resources. So I think those are very exciting opportunities. These are the people involved. So this is the the team within the next two project. So myself, of course, uh, Yuan, who is a beamline scientist. Izu has been our engineer. Oleg has done a lot of the simulation work and especially helping us to set up the simulations in the first place so that we can mess around with them. And then these guys are our project staff who are helping with the, the nitty gritty of actually building the beamline. Uh, control account managers, um, the, Eric is doing the building design, Lonnie's photon delivery system in the end station, and then these guys providing infrastructure and control support for the beamline. All right, and this is my final slide. So the, the technique encourages flexibility. Um, it allows you to, to take advantage of the, uh, the illuminating conditions of the sample. And, and in fact, anything that you happen to know about the sample or that you control about the sample's environment in recovering the image or the estimate of the image. And the, the, um, the information that you can derive is very interesting. So it's very interesting because you not only get a high resolution absorption image, you can also manipulate the contrast of the phase, which gives you um, kind of a, a phase contrast without the, the degradation that you would see in a phase contrast measurement at, for example, a full field imaging a microscope where you used a Zernike face plate or something like that. Um, the, we think that, well, the literature demonstrates uh, that, that CDI is applicable to a wide range of disciplines. And, and this beamline, as you see from the design, is particularly targeting uh, the growth of these fields into the time resolved and, uh, and the regime where you can look at larger functional materials or particles within larger functional materials. So in the near future, BNL is going to have this beamline. As I said, first light is expected in January of 25. So, you know, you should start explain, uh, planning experiments now. And if anyone has any great ideas for small modifications, I would love to work with you on that to make that happen. And I will open the floor for questions.